We hope you'll be blessed and inspired and challenged and motivated by this fresh word from Christian Heritage Church. If you can take your Bibles this morning and turn to Luke chapter 21, just leave them open there. I want to talk to you about the fact that today we're living in dangerous times. When we talk about that, we're aware that many are fascinated with studies of prophecy and the end times. I can remember even as a small boy growing up in church and seeing all the charts and graphs that certain evangelists would bring in that would tell us exactly what was going to happen and an approximate of when it was going to happen. Talked about the seven seals, the book of the Revelation, the great beasts, and on and on and on it would go. However, when I talk about the end times and think about it, I don't want to hear what some preacher has to say. I want to hear what Jesus has to say. That's exactly what we find in Luke chapter 21. Matter of fact, if you look at 2 Timothy chapter 3, before we get to our text, Paul really described what the last days were going to look like. He said this beginning in verse 1 of 2 Timothy chapter 3, Know this, that in the last days perilous, dangerous times will come. Men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful and holy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, heady, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. I could stop right there and just give you an apt description of our society, amen? Amen. That talks about uh, society today in the 21st century and exactly what we are seeing. But when we really look at what Jesus says, sometimes it doesn't align with what a lot of preachers, prognosticators are saying today. So I want to know what does Jesus say about the end times in the last days. It's interesting to me that since AD 44, AD 44, just a few years after Jesus died and ascended into heaven, AD 44, there have been no less than 242 recorded prophecies as to when the Lord was coming back again. Matter of fact, when I was doing the research for this message, I found 37 pages of prophecies about when the world was going to end, when Jesus was coming back again. Can I tell you that all of them have proved to be untrue? Why is that? Because Jesus said in Matthew chapter 25, verse 13, no man knows the day or the hour when the Son of Man will return. Only the Father in heaven knows that day. However, we see a lot of folks that try to use dates and times and timelines and current events and circumstances to promote themselves, their ministry, and often to promote what they're selling. Can I say that? Well, I just did. To promote what they're selling. To promote fear in the hearts of people to make them buy their product. You know, it's, it's very interesting to me that one particular group has missed it nine times. I kid you not, nine times. You say, well, who is it? I want to stay away from them. Well, you should. It's the Jehovah's Witnesses. They have predicted the return of Christ nine times and every single time been wrong. You can't build good teaching on false doctrine. Amen. That's all I'm going to say about that. You take it and think about it. When I look at our society, I have to acknowledge that We're a mess. Our culture is a mess. The world is a mess. Society is a mess. And when I look up the definition of mess in the dictionary, you know what it tells me? It tells me it's a jumble, a hodgepodge, a state of embarrassment. It's trouble, difficulty, confusion. It's a state of being disorderly, untidy, or dirty. The word mess really does capture the state of the last days. That fits right in with what I read from 2 Timothy chapter 3 in the words of Paul. You know, the age in which we live has been called a lot of things. It's been called the atomic age, the space age, the age of Aquarius, the information age, also the computer age. But I submit to you this morning that it's a mess. It's a mess. That's the best way you can describe it. Look around you, we have a social mess, one of lawlessness and luxury, one of entitlement and privilege, one of racial divides and hatred and anger. We have a political mess. We can't seem to do anything in politics to help America. We're all interested in helping ourselves. You can say amen or oh me. Our politics are filled with graft and greed, and it just doesn't work. We have a religious mess, one of apathy and apostasy and false doctrine and teaching. 
We have an international mess, one of tension and turmoil and terrorism. By any honest evaluation from any intelligent person, they would have to tell you, yes, the world really is a mess. Society really is a mess. But you and I as believers shouldn't despair. We should understand we hold the remedy. We hold the answer. We hold words of life that is good news to a world that is a mess. We have a message of hope in an age of despair. And that should be good news to all those that we come in contact with. Amen? The world is confused. The world is in despair. But you and I as believers should not be in despair nor confused. Paul said it this way in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 8 and 9. We're troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We're perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. What is he saying? He's saying we experience the same thing that the rest of the world experiences, but we react in a different manner. We respond in a different way. And we respond in a different way because of the hope that is within us. That's what he said to the church at Colossae in Colossians 1.5. He said, the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, of which you have heard before in the word of truth of the gospel. We need to understand that we have a message of hope for a hopeless world. We respond differently in difficult and dangerous times. That's why we can sing this morning, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but I wholly lean on Jesus' name. Somebody ought to say amen this morning. We are here to anchor into a living Christ. We have hope when the world is hopeless. We have a message of hope when only despair surrounds us. Even though people are mired in confusion and chaos, we still know the way because we serve the Master. Amen. Matthew chapter 24, Mark chapter 13, and Luke chapter 21 are all parallel chapters. The three writers are all telling the same story from their perspective. And they're all covering the teachings of Jesus and the prophecies of Jesus regarding the end times. So this morning, I want us to look at Luke chapter 21 and see what Jesus says about the end times, about the last days, because really, he's the final word, amen? He's the one that we should listen to. So let's look at that. And I want you to notice in Luke chapter 21, look at verses 7 and 8. Teacher, they ask, when will these things happen and what will be the sign that they're about to take place? Now I want you to watch what Jesus did. Jesus didn't answer their question. They were looking for signs. They were looking for indicators. He didn't answer their question. He didn't give them what they wanted. He gave them what they needed. Oh, come on, folks, we need to hear that today because we walk into churches trying to get something that we want when in reality, God knows what we need. And we need to open our heart and say, God, move my preconceptions, move all my ideas out of the way and give me what you know I need, which is exactly what Jesus said. Look at verse 8. He replied, watch out that you're not deceived. For many will come in my name claiming I am he, the time is near, do not follow them. They said, show us a sign, tell us what it's going to look like. And he said, don't be deceived. He, instead of giving them the details of the end times, gave them what they needed to live victoriously in the end times. Oh, come on, folks, this is what we've got to catch this morning. He is interested in doing, giving to you, empowering you with grace and mercy and strength and wisdom and knowledge so that in the end times, you can live victoriously for Jesus Christ. So that you're not buying... Uh, how did we used to say that in Oklahoma? You're not buying uh, something that's unreal, something that is fake, false, or fake. He said, do not be deceived. Paul even warned about it in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1, when he said, in the last days, there will be those who come preaching the doctrine of devils, telling you you shouldn't marry, telling you to abstain from certain foods, and more and more. Jesus said, in the last times, watch out for false Christ, false prophets, people who claim to be, I am he. He warns us to watch out for that. 
And then he says, watch out for those who tell you the time is near. Watch out for those who tell you the time is near. I began thinking about that, and just in my short lifetime, yeah, I'm very young, so you all know that, right? In my short lifetime, there have been multiple individuals who have tried to tell us the time is upon us. Who remembers the book, 88 Reasons Why Jesus Will Come at 88? Didn't happen, did it? But he sold a lot of books and made a lot of money. Who remembers the Y2K scare that when the, when the calendar rolls over to the year 2000, everything is going to shut down. We won't have any utilities of any kind. The computers won't work anymore. Jesus is going to come. Here we are 17 years later and we're still here, right? I mean, I can go on and on and on and on. 242 times that have been recorded, men have said, this is the day, this is the time, this is the hour when Jesus is coming back again. Jesus said, don't follow those who say the time is near. Why? And here's what I want you to hear. This is why he said that, because if you follow those who are always saying the time is near, it takes your focus from the importance. It takes your focus from his command. What was his command? Matthew 24, 14. This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached, then shall the end come. Do you understand we have a job, folks? We have a responsibility. We have something that we have been commissioned to accomplish, and that is to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. Every man, woman, boy, and girl deserves to hear that Jesus Christ died for their sins. He rose again on the third day, and he sits at the right hand of the Father, ever making intercession for you and me. Every person needs to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. See, and any time we focus on the end is near, it takes our attention from our task, from our assignment. It diverts our resources to other things rather than reaching the world for Jesus Christ. Now, I'm thankful that we're a missions church, but listen to me, we're a long ways from where we need to be. Amen? A long ways from where we need to be. We have got to understand our priority. The reason we exist as a church is to reach men for Jesus Christ. We have to do all that we can do, all in our power, all in our ability, all in our resources to tell people about Jesus. Because when Jesus says to us in Matthew 24, 14, the gospel shall be preached in all the nations for a witness, then shall the end come. You know what he means? He means the gospel is going to be preached to everybody. Then the end shall come. Do you realize that 42% of our population on planet Earth have never heard the gospel once? Not once. So when we allow our attention to be diverted from our mission, then we allow the plan of God to be subverted. God is calling us not to follow those who say the time is near, but to follow the one who said, go into all the world and make disciples of every creature, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. He who believes shall be saved. He who believes not shall be damned. That's what he's asking us to do. Church, I'm challenging you this morning. Don't allow your vision, your focus, your attention to be taken off the task and the mission that God has assigned to us. Jesus said to his disciples, in the end times, there will be those who say, the time is near, do not follow them. Can't be much clearer than that, can it? Because anytime we wrap ourselves up in this type of thing, we lose what we're supposed to be doing. So he says, don't follow them. And then second, he says, first he says, don't be deceived. Second, he says, do not be frightened. Look at verses 9 through 11 of Luke 21. When you hear of wars and revolutions, do not be frightened. These things must happen first, but the end will not yet come right away. Then he said to them, nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There will be great earthquakes and famines and pestilences in various places and fearful events and great signs from the heaven. I read that and I thought, my goodness, he is writing 2017 in that verse of Scripture. Is he not? I mean, we have some little fat North Korean guy threatening to nuke the world. There are wars and rumors of wars. We've been at war since 2001 in the Middle East, and there is no resolution on the horizon. Israel is constantly pressured by its enemies, both from without and within. We need to stand with them and believe God for peace in Jerusalem. Can you say amen? 
Wars and rumors of wars happening all around us. There's nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom, earthquakes. Did you know what happened in Mexico last week? There was another major earthquake. Famines. Have you ever been to the sub-Saharan Africa? Do you realize that people are starving every single day? Do you realize that around the world, famines are real? They're a part of life in many areas. Pestilences. AIDS may be the biggest pestilence the world has ever seen. A pestilence. In various places, fearful events, great signs from heaven. Think about it. Just in the last month here, two hurricanes in the United States, an earthquake in Mexico, wildfires ravaging the West. On and on and on it goes. But what did Jesus say? He said, when you see these things, don't be frightened. Oh, you need to take that to heart, church, because the world wants you to be frightened. The media wants you to be frightened. Do you hear what I'm saying? Those with an agenda to manipulate you and to motivate you want you to be frightened. But Jesus said, don't be afraid. Don't be frightened. These things are going to happen. Don't let fear motivate or dominate your life. I've said this several times in the last month, but I need to say it again. Paul said to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7, For God has not given you a spirit of fear. You need to understand that fear is a spirit, a spirit that comes from the pit of hell that's driven by the enemy because the enemy knows if he can make you afraid and frightened, he neutralizes you as a believer. He takes you out of the game and out of the fight. He has not given you a spirit of fear, but he's given you power and love and a sound mind. I really like that last one, a sound mind. Because if we have a sound mind, we're able to rightly divide the word of truth. We're able to discern the times. We're able to understand what God's word means and how we apply it to our lives. And we don't succumb to fear when we have a sound mind. That's pretty good stuff, whether you say amen or not. We need to understand He has not given us a spirit of fear. He has given us power, love, and a sound mind. If Jesus is your Lord, and if we believe He is the King of kings and Lord of lords, then shouldn't we take His word to heart? Do not fear. Do not be frightened. It's an encouragement from Him. When we see things occurring, our natural response is fear. But the supernatural response is faith. The supernatural response is to believe God. The supernatural response is to stand in the gap for a culture that is dying and gasping its last breath. A supernatural response is being used of God. So you're going to respond in the natural or in the supernatural. Jesus said, don't be frightened when you see these things happening. They must happen first. Then the end comes. Do you hear what he said? They must happen first. Oh, come on, folks, this pie-in-the-sky doctrine of Christianity that says once you're saved, nothing bad's ever going to touch you is alive from the pit of hell. I'm going to tell you this morning that you and I are walking in shoe leather, breathing atmosphere, and we need to understand that as long as we're bound in this restricted human body, some bad things will touch us. I don't know what I'm going to say this, but I'm going to say it anyway. Some of us need to understand that we are not more special in Tallahassee than they were in the Keys. Come on, I heard so many people say it this week, it infuriates me. Yes, we were spared the ravages of Hurricane Irma. And yes, we give God thanks and praise for that. But it doesn't mean we're any more righteous or holy or heard in the presence of God than the folks that live in South Florida or the islands of the Caribbean. Come on, you give him praise for his mercy, but you don't condemn and judge those who suffered the effects of that hurricane. Get that stinking thinking out of your mind. If you say that to somebody, you've just ruined your witness. You've just taken yourself out of a place where you have the ability to speak into your life because you're talking craziness. Can it be any plainer than that? You're just talking craziness. Quit talking like that. Just give God praise for His mercy and pray for those that were touched. Amen. Jesus said, don't be frightened. So He says to us, don't be deceived, don't be frightened. Number three, He said, don't worry about how you will respond in difficult times or how you will respond in persecution. Look at verses 12 through 15. 
Before all this, they will lay hands on you and persecute you. They will deliver you to synagogues and prisons, and you'll be brought before kings and governors, and all on account of my name. This will result in your being witnesses to them. Did you catch that? God has the divine ability to turn bad things into good things. It's not a good thing to be persecuted, but when God can take that persecution and turn it into a witness for Jesus Christ, that's a good thing. He has the uncanny ability to take what seems to be so horrible in our lives and flip it for something that's worthy of glory and honor to Him. Oh, somebody ought to be shouting about that. I'm here to tell you. Right over here, sitting on this front row, Doug's back as an usher this morning. Can you give God praise? Right over here. He walked into my office this morning with his usher coat on, and I said, all right, God's on the throne. Y'all know what happened, right? A few months ago, he had a massive heart attack. The doctor sent him home to die. You know what he did last week? He was out cleaning up his yard from the debris of the storm and mowing the grass. That's not what happens when you're dying. He's alive through the power of Jesus Christ. Oh, come on, somebody needs to get this. God can take the bad things in our life and flip them so they bring glory and honor to Him. That's what we need to understand. In the times of pressure, in the times of persecution, in the times when we are in the wine press being squeezed, we need to know God's going to bring something good out of that. If we remember, don't be deceived and don't be afraid. God's going to bring us through. He's going to bring us through and bring glory and honor to his name because of that. He will use those occasions as a witness. And he will give us words and wisdom to speak in our defense. That's good news. That's wonderful news, actually, that he will fill my mouth and my mind with his words and his wisdom and make me a witness for him. And then don't be surprised if people betray you. In the last days, betrayal will be very, very clear. Luke 21, 16 through 19. You'll be betrayed even by parents and brothers and relatives and friends, and they will put some of you to death. All men will hate you because of me, but not a hair of your head will perish by standing firm. You gain life. The King James says, in patience you preserve your soul. When you stand firm, when you don't give in, when you don't back up, you say, well, that isn't happening in America Well, can I encourage you not to be myoptic, not to be short-sighted? Understand that around the world, this is actually happening every single day. People are being betrayed because of their faith by their family, by their friends, by their neighbors. Do you understand that for years in the Islamic world, people have been killed when they convert to Jesus Christ? That's something that happens because of the family and their false religion. ISIS, Al-Qaeda, Boko Haram in Nigeria. On and on and on we can go with those groups and individuals who desire to annihilate the church of Jesus Christ. And by, by accomplishing that mission, they're killing Christians. But do you understand that they will never succeed because greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world? Do you understand? Believers may fall, but the church will only rise. We've got to understand the power that's in the witness of the persecuted as we stand before Jesus Christ. In hostile times, in dangerous times, expect betrayal. I don't know if this is a prophecy or not. You can take it for whatever you want to take it for. But I stand set before you today, let me rephrase that, to declare that If the Lord tarries, there will come a day in America we'll see this very thing occurring. When the church is persecuted, when when believers are betrayed by family and friends and relatives and those who are supposed to love them and care for them, it will happen even in this country. What's happening around the world will occur here as well. Let me just give you another word. Changing of the presidents isn't going to save America. The only thing that's going to save America is repentance. When you and I fall on our face and ask God to forgive us, and you understand repentance isn't just speaking, but repentance is turning. It's walking away from that evil or that sin. When you and I choose to repent, when you and I see the need to repent, when our country begins to repent, then we can see God do something in our country. But it's not going to happen until we as a nation... Turn back towards God. We must repent. 
We must repent. You know, you talk about the Holocaust. What was there, like 11 million people Hitler killed through the Holocaust, 6 million of them Jews? You can talk about the, the regimes through history who've annihilated and used genocide to wipe out segments of the population. But can I tell you, none of them have been more violent or more prolific in killing than the United States of America through abortion. 61 million babies have been aborted on the altar of convenience. Folks, we need to repent. As a nation, we need to repent. We see this as a sign of the end times, and we understand the only way to turn is through repentance. The solution to persecution, Jesus gave it to us, stand firm. When you're persecuted, stand firm. Don't worry about what you're going to say. Stand firm, and he will carry us through. Don't give up. Don't fall away when things turn against you. And then number five, he said, be confident in him. Look at Luke 21, 25 through 28. There'll be signs of the sun, the moon, and the stars. On the earth, nations will be in anguish and perplexity at the roaring and tossing of the sea. Sounds pretty familiar, doesn't it? Just had a solar eclipse and two hurricanes. Men will faint from terror, apprehensive of what is coming on the world, for the heavenly bodies will be shaken. At that time, they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Listen to verse 28. This is where the believer's hope is hinged. When these things begin to take place, stand up, lift up your heads, because your redemption is drawing nigh. Hallelujah! In the midst of turmoil, in the midst of danger, there is a seed of hope. Your redemption draweth nigh. Oh, come on, folks. We've got to understand that's what he promised to you and me. Number six, don't give up. When the heavens and the earth are shaking, when signs occur, we are not to fear, we are not to give up, but we see those as a signal of the Lord's coming. Our redemption draw us nigh. Last one, number seven, be on your guard. Look at Luke chapter 21, verses 34 through 36. Be careful, or your hearts will be weighed down with dissipation, drunkenness, and the anxieties of life. And that day will close on you unexpectedly like a trap. For it will come upon all those who live on the face of the earth. Be always on the watch and pray that you may be able to escape all that's about to happen and that you may be able to stand before the Son of Man. I really like the way the Amplified Bible says it. It reads it this way, Be on guard so your hearts are not weighed down and depressed with the giddiness of debauchery, with partying all the time, with being drunk, with the... Nausea of self-indulgence and the worldly worries of life. Verse 36, keep alert at all times. Be attentive and ready, praying that you may have the strength and ability to be found worthy and to escape all these things that are going to take place. You see, Jesus closed this passage with an exhortation to his disciples. He said, be careful, be on your guard. There's no room for casual Christianity. There's no room for casual faith. Listen, going to church on Sunday morning isn't going to get you into the kingdom of God. You have to have a relationship with Jesus. You have to know Him as your Lord and as your Savior. You have to walk with Him and talk with Him each and every day. Just because you got baptized when you were 10 years old doesn't mean you're going to make it. Just because you went through confirmation doesn't mean you're going to make it. The only way you have the assurance and I have the assurance that we will stand with God is by accepting Jesus as our Lord and Savior. There are no other avenues and there are no other ways regardless of what people would want you to believe today. There is still just one way to the Father and that's through His Son, Jesus Christ. We must remember that, practice it, preach it. We cannot have a nonchalant approach to our faith. And then we have to avoid harmful conduct. Conduct like dissipation and drunkenness. So many people, when they see the dangerous times in which we live, choose to self-medicate. They self-medicate. They turn to a bottle of pills, or they turn to a bottle of alcohol, or they turn to some other vice that gives them a measure of peace for a moment. 
Can I tell you, when you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, He has promised you peace that never ends, that never goes away, that cannot be duplicated by anything the world has to offer. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world gives, give I unto you. He said in John chapter 14, He said, let not your heart be troubled, neither be afraid. You believe in God, believe also in me. That's his injunction to you and I today. Understand our peace comes through him, not through self-medicating. So many people in our world today are addicted to some form of drugs or alcohol that they they are completely bound. I believe in the service this morning, God wants to break that bondage off. He wants to set you free. He wants you to leave knowing you serve a risen Lord and Savior who is your peace. Who is your peace? He goes on to say, don't let the anxieties of life bog you down. Turn your focus away from Jesus. And that can happen very easily, can't it? It can happen so quickly. I mean, just think back seven days ago. And the threat of Hurricane Irma moving down upon Florida and upon Tallahassee. How easily it was to divert your attention from pursuing God, following God, finding your peace in God, to making preparation for that hurricane. Now, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with preparation. We prepared too. We never lived through a hurricane. I have now, amen. Never had before. So I did what people told me to do. I prepared. I'm going to use wisdom. But at the same time, I stayed focused on who can I tell about Jesus Christ. Someone said, why did you have church last Sunday morning? Because I want our focus to be on Jesus, not on the storm. I want our focus to be on the Lord of glory, not on a hurricane moving through the Gulf. We have to understand we have to come to the place where the anxieties of life don't bog us down or turn our focus away from Jesus. He said, if you don't heed the warnings, if you aren't careful, if you don't avoid harmful conduct, if you you do allow the anxieties of life to bog you down, then the end times will come on you unexpectedly like a trap. You'll be surprised. So be always on watch. It's a good thing to take your spiritual pulse. How am I doing today? Am I in tune with the Lord today? Is His heart beating in mind today? How are we doing? And it's a good thing to pray concerning these things. That's what He told us. Pray, pray, pray. The goal and the object of our prayers is that we live in such a way that the Lord is reflected through our lives to those around us. That we live in such a way that our witness is never compromised by anxiety or by self-medicating or by moving our focus away from Jesus Christ. would be wise not to focus too much on the signs. Because what Jesus told his disciples is, don't worry about the signs, worry about how you're going to live. And that's what we have to remember. Don't worry about the signs. Worry about how you're going to live victoriously in Jesus Christ. Are we living in the end times? Yes, I believe we probably are. But I also believe we can't expend our energy and our efforts focusing on the signs. But rather we expend our energy, our effort, our talent, our resources on living godly, faithful, Christ-centered lives and are ready when Jesus does come back. The greatest thing we can say is, I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm ready. Nothing has distracted me. So my question to you this morning is, are you ready? Are you ready? The signs are there. We understand it. But Jesus told us how to live in these dangerous times. So are you practicing what he taught us? Are you not being deceived, not being afraid? Are you embracing the truths we talked about this morning so that he can be honored and glorified? Let me say it one more time. Jesus said in Matthew 24, 14, the good news about the kingdom will be preached throughout the whole world so that all nations will hear it, then the end will come. 42% of our world has never heard the gospel one time. It's the responsibility of the church to take the message to all the world, so that Jesus will come again. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Tom, would you come back? Across this room this morning, I have one question for you. 
And that question is, are you ready? Are you ready? If Jesus should return today, are you ready? If your life should be terminated today, are you ready? If you should fall to a heart attack or a car wreck or a plane accident, are you ready? That's the only question you need to answer. It's a question that's between you and God. I can't answer it for you. Your wife or your husband can't answer it for you. Your mom or your dad can't answer it for you. Between you and God, are you ready? Are you ready to receive him at any moment, to have him receive you at any moment? Spirit of God, right now, touch hearts and touch lives. Bring those to you who need to be ready. Bring those to you who need to be delivered. Bring those to you who need to get rid of the fear that's dominating their lives. I pray it in Jesus' name. Across the room this morning, you say, Steve, I want to know that I'm ready. I want to ask Christ to come to my heart and into my life, to forgive me, to cleanse me, to change me. I want to know when I leave this room this morning that I'm ready to meet God. That's you right where you sit across this room. Would you just slip up your hand and say, pray for me. That's me. I'll wait for a moment for you to respond. That's me. I want to know that I'm ready. I want to know that I'm ready. I'll wait just a moment. Yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you. Anyone else? I want to know that I'm ready. Yes, sir. I want to know that I'm ready. Yes, sir. I want to know that I'm ready. We're living in dangerous times. Our hope is Jesus Christ. I want to know that I'm ready. Yes, sir. Anyone else? You'll raise your hand with these four. So wait just another moment. Stand to your feet with me today across the sanctuary. The four of you who lifted your hands, I want you to step out right now and come. Don't wait for anybody else. Just step out and come. God's going to meet you in this altar this morning. And he's going to, when you leave, you're going to know that you are ready. If you raise your hand, step out right now and come. God's going to assure you that you are ready. Come on. If you raise your hand, step out and come. Amen. Praise you, Father. Pastor Chris, step right up here. Pray with me this morning, please. Dear Jesus, I'm a sinner and I need a Savior. I know I can't save myself. I ask you to cleanse me, forgive me, change me, make me ready to receive you. Lord, we confess our sins right now and we ask that you'd forgive us and cleanse us in the name of Jesus. Do a work deep in our heart and deep in our life. In Jesus' name I pray. Pastor Chris, pray with each one of these young men, please. Lead them to the Lord. Amen. You're here this morning, the second part of this invitation. You've been bound. Some of you are bound by fear. Incapacitated. Unable to do anything for the kingdom because of the fear that is controlling you and binding you. This morning, God wants to set you free. So if that's you, would you just step out and come? You want to be victorious over that fear this morning. We're going to pray a prayer of faith, and God's going to do that work in your life this morning. Feel free to come as Tom begins to sing. Just step out and come. God's going to do a work in your life. If you're bound by any other addiction, step out and come. God can set you free this morning and cause you to be the person you want to be and desire to be. So as we sing, if that's you, just step out and come this morning. Our prayer is that God will take this word and plant good eternal seeds deep into your soul. Father, we pray for your great wisdom to infiltrate this listener, draw them to you, and take them gently down the road to their next destination in life. And if you're in need of a home church, we invite you to join us at Christian Heritage Church on Shera Road in Tallahassee, Florida. A multicultural church founded on the truth of God's Word and the power of the Holy Spirit. For a worship service where the presence of God has first place, you're invited to Christian Heritage Church. Sunday morning service is at 1030, Wednesday evening at 7, plus youth group and kid power and small groups and more. For all the latest information, visit our website, chctoday.com.